Welcome to the studio clinic here at the Hi-Fi Clinic. The finest recovery, restoration, and studio clinic since the Reagan administration. Do you remember the Reagan administration? Vaguely. V vaguely, okay. We are here, we are the vintage stereo console experts for people with acquired tastes who like to think different. Don't forget that. We're thrilled to have Chicago's legendary underground 90s music superfan, William Patrick Turkmenistan, here with us today on the latest episode of our expert interview series. Have you seen the, the previous episodes? I mean, it's quite voluminous, okay? Long time follower, first time visitor. Hi, Doggo, I'm very, very happy to be here. Thank you for All having right. me. All right, William, welcome to the Hi-Fi Clinic and welcome back to America. William, you've attended dozens and upon dozens of concerts in Chicago. You're like a local legend, which is why we introduced you that way. Uh, and so in Chicago and the surrounding land, so not just, you know, your own little private Idaho, but bigger than that. You're a self-proclaimed, my words, not yours, junkie of live music equals success. We want to share your musical life story with our eagles out there who are too afraid after the Bataclan to attend live music equals success shows. So that's the context here, all right? Mm -hmm. So I've got a series of questions for you and really want to thank you again for showing up. So first question, when did you see your first concert and who was it? That's a great question. And how old were you? Yeah, believe it or not, yeah. Reagan administration? Yes, definitely Reagan administration. I was, I think, six or seven, and it was an Amy Grant concert at the old, um, it was now it, the Rosemont Horizon, believe it or not. And not, not a fan, just, just, that's, who I, that's who I saw. That was my first, as far as I can remember, first concert. So how, why did you go? I mean, were you just my listening to her on the radio? Went. Did you listen to her on Spotify? No, and you're like, no. hey, this is great. I I went, got... My older sister had gone. Oh, wow. But then quickly changed tunes, and just a few years later, um, went to, to redeem myself. I did see um, Robert Plant at Wilmont, and then soon after was at the first um, Lollapalooza. You're at the first one. At the first one. We'll get to that. Yeah, but I was at the first Lollapalooza at the... Um, Grant Park? No, it was... Tinley Park? Tinley oh, Park. The World, World Music Theater? World Music Theater, Tinley Park. Wow, you're... you're but that was when I was, that was uh, the, the ripe old age of 16. No, 15. That's why you're a legend. You, at 15, you went to the first Lollapalooza. I, That's at, a, I went to the first three, actually. Wow. What happened to you then? Fell off the wagon, huh? Well, pretty much. Right. Yeah, we'll get it. Yeah, I guess. Right. Excellent. We'll yeah. yeah. So, what, what's your favorite music show memorabilia? Because I've been to your room in your mm -hmm. your your um, apartment in Berlin, and mm -hmm. I've seen all the memorabilia there. Mm -hmm. Some tremendous stuff. I mean, when you die, they're going to make a museum out of yeah. just yeah. your memorabilia. Yeah. So, what's your favorite music show memorabilia? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, that's why I asked it. Yeah. That, thank you. Yeah, and expect nothing less. Um, I would have to say. Wilco did a, um, a residency show maybe 10 or 12 years ago where they played five nights in a row and they played their entire catalog. Mm -hmm. And every single evening they had a poster for each night and each one of the posters came together to make an entire large poster. And I have all five of those. And uh, those, they're, it's amazing. And they're all done by, um, they were pulled prints signed by a local artist that did a lot of the concert posters. Um, that would have to be my favorite. Now, sadly, of all the concert posters, those are still rolled up in tubes and not framed because it, it's a little cost to do that, but those are my favorite. I was afraid you were going to say that, sadly, they got destroyed in no. a vinyl fire at no, my apartment. No, you know, you know me better than that. I'm a little... No, our eagles don't, though. That's I'm a, why. I'm a little puckered, so I, I actually tend to treat those things with a little care, and so those are rolled up nicely. Almost and, like a baby. Uh, yeah, yeah, like a baby. They are in, you know, sands the body powder but awesome. they're good. They're nice and dry in the tube. Very nice, very nice. I see you're drinking Old Style. That's right. And anything you, any connection that you have to Old Style? I mean, it's... It's just an easy drinking beer. You give me the Papsu Ribbon, the Old Style, the Schlitz. What's the difference between PBR and Old Style? Not much. Okay. But they just taste fantastic. Okay. Easy drinking. What's the longest you ever stood outside the double door to get an autograph or meet a band? Double or not so much, okay. but the Metro. I went to the when Prince came back and had a revival show, he did a show and uh, one hour or one hour into his set, there was an announcement on XRT that it was gonna do an after show at the Metro that was free. All you had to do is go stand outside the Metro to get in. So I raced up there um, with a uh, certain female lady friend 
Um, I have no idea what her name is now, but we went up there for a couple hours in the cold and waited outside. Wow. And then went and saw, and what was ironic, it was Prince Macy Gray and um, what's his name? Um, Common. Oh, really? Common at the time was, was like baby. nothing yeah. at the time. And so Prince came out in all his glorious four foot two glory and just purple wah. And I stood probably a good 10 feet from him at the Metro. And he came out and just kind of jammed a bit. Then Macy Gray came out, towered over him because she's a, she's a tall gal. And then Common came out and Common, and I don't know if he opened for the show, but he did a free form rap, which no one really knew him at the time. This is probably maybe 12 years ago. I mean, it was maybe longer. I don't know how Common, but it was Common, Macy Gray and Prince. It was an after show at the Metro. It was very good. And that rivaled that. I mean, that was cool. They did more of a jam session, and that ra rivaled the uh, the Smashing Pumpkins set in '93 at the Metro. Okay. That was uh that was probably I would say that set and a Bare Naked Ladies set about a year and a half later were my two favorite shows in the Metro. So talk about your your namesake, William Patrick Corgan. Yes. So how did you how, you know like. When did you and he decide that he was going to be the famous one out of the two of you? Well, you know, it's a long story. He's a better wrestler than I am, and he won. I don't know. No, in all fairness. When did you see him? When was the first time you saw the Pumpkins, the I greatest Chicago rock band ever of the late 80s, early 90s? Late ladies, yeah. It, it rivals Ruka Salt and maybe a little Urge Oval Care. We'll, yeah, we'll see. Good call. Yeah. Um, I First time I saw him was 93 at the Metro, but I also saw them... And I'm getting my years a little mixed up. We did the, when they did the Siamese Dream Record release at Tower Records, they did an acoustic set in Tower Records at Belden and Clark. Yeah. And be, when the oh, Tower yeah, Records was yeah, there. And so we stood in line. It was my older sister, myself, and my other buddy from high school, two other buddies from high school. We stood in line. That was another, well, we waited. It went a long time, but it was warm out then. We stood in line. We saw their, um, a set, and they, they played acoustic versions of uh, Siamese Dream. And there was a, a simulcast recording of that. And you can hear me screaming, because I have actually on tape yeah. a recording of it, you can hear me screaming in between sets uh, like a little idiot, but it's funny to hear my voice. And then the thing that I'm kicking myself is they signed Spin Record. Remember Spin Record magazine? Yeah. Yeah. They were on the cover of that. And they were standing for signing autographs. And I was like, yeah, I'm not going to wait. My sister waited in line, and she still has all four DRC, Chamberlain, Ia, and uh, and Corrigan signed all the whole all the whole uh, magazine, and I'm kicking myself for not waiting in line with her. We just we waited in Tower Records and looked at other like tapes or whatever while she was waiting. Like, yeah, we're not going to wait in line. That was a little regret. So, all right, yeah, that's a good good one. I should have uh, asked you about your, your regrets, but you know, when did you know that Wilco would be your favorite band? Um, you know what? I didn't. I was. Um, so Brandon Blaney, uh, a friend of mine at University of Kansas, where I went to school, um, and he was uh, across the hall from me, and he actually brought them to my attention, and it was um, their first album, and and I had actually, um, and it was I had known of. Well, this is the deal. So give us the deal. That's why yeah, we're here. This, this is, is the, the expert interview so, series. So again, another big regret. Uh -oh. Uncle Tupelo, which was the band before Wilco. Right. So Tupelo, James Farrar, and Tweedy were the primary guys. They had a little falling out. Rumor was it that it was the um, the ex owner of and and manager of the Lounge Axe, Susan, who is now Tweedy's wife. There was a little bit of a split because she originally was dating Jay Farrar, and then Tweedy stole her from him, and that's what actually caused the split between. Wow. Uh, Uncle Tupelo. This is like an episode of The View. Yeah, yeah right. Love so um, that's the rumor. Okay. So they say. I'm not from what I've heard. And anywho, Uncle Tupelo, which is arguably the greatest, like they were like the punk band that really formed and or influenced so many bands. Anyways, they were doing their farewell tour and they played in Lawrence and I they were playing at a band, uh, I, it was at the, um, I forget the name of the place, it was on Mass Street. Anyways, I had a test the next day, and I decided to study for this test. Uh, I don't even know what class it was, and my buddy, Matt McDermott, I'm dropping names, Matt, sorry, course, okay. he, he actually knew about them, and, and, uh, and I had heard their stuff, and I loved their stuff, and, he, and he's like, we should go. I'm like, no, I got a test, and I didn't go. So that, that is probably, that's bigger than the Pumpkin's autograph. I could have I seen Uncle Tupelo. Long story short, they split, 
that was um and and then the Wilco album came out and I hadn't realized that Tweedy had formed Wilco from there and I got it uh and their first album being not being there um I don't I can't remember the album's name right now but he Brandon had uh let me hear it and that was it and then they evolved though they went from alt country really up to like the thing that's great about Wilco is as they evolved usually bands have sophomore slumps their first album's great because they have this rawness about them and they're not influenced by whatever a producer or whatever you want to call it and then it's rawness and it's kind of their true essence and then they have a sophomore slump and then it seems to be sort of just manufactured I think Wilco has done a great job of evolving. I think they hit a little bit of a slump with their fifth or sixth album, but they've come out of it again and they've really done well. But um, I, you know, when you look at the high water mark of them, as far as I'm concerned, you've got um, Summer Teeth and you've got Yankee Hotel Foxtrot. And for me, being there, their double album, there's is my favorite. So they really evolved from alt country into, which is an amazing stuff, into really this sort of, I don't know how to describe it, but just really a nice poppy, good old fashioned rock and roll with great lyrics. So reminds me of Aerosmith. Hey, hey, Am I right? Yeah, that's right. Exactly. So what, Don't step on my big 10 yeah, inch, you know? Yeah, or run DMC, yeah, you know, same thing, yeah, right? right? They had exactly. a sophomore slump. They got a slump buster out. Third yeah. album, much better. Thanks for I went off on a little, a little, but you brought me back. Yeah, so thank man. you. Yep. All right. What band that you discovered at a Chicago street festival, but never, but that band never made it. Do you feel was like Harry Carey when he was the White Sox announcer at the end of his run? Like he was great but he never really... A, a little drunk, a little out there, just couldn't quite keep it together. And and fell off the face of the planet, right? We're, I mean, nobody heard of Harry Carey after he left the White Sox. We were promised jetpacks. That's the one? That's the one. That's a band. That's a band. Okay, so we, were, we, were, pack of we, we were promised jetpacks. Look it up, great band. Which street festival? It was uh, Randolph, actually. Okay. Yeah. So how many years ago? Not I too couldn't many. tell you, like, but it was Randolph. Like five, because I mean... No, it was longer. Like 15. It's not, Maybe it's, it's not 2018. No, mid 90s. No, it was no, 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 no. It was. I mean, mid 90s. I wasn't really living in Chicago at the time. Um, yeah, but when you were seeing the Pumpkins and some of these other ones, I mean, you were living in Iowa and you still made the track. I did the I did. pilgrimage, yeah. if you will. I kind of, I went off the wagon when I was, you know, getting my higher edu education. I didn't come back to Chicago that oh. much. But when you were growing up in Iowa, that's when you would make the yeah, trek here. That was you know high school formative years. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, I want to take a go back in time a little bit here. When you were on a date in 1998, what Chicago band would you put on the jukebox at Club Lucky? Oh, that's a good one. 1998. Good God. Yeah. Just a few years ago. Mm-hmm. You've been to Club Lucky. Many oh, times. oh, oh, yeah. I mean, let's just say and just let's go scare Al, Gear Daddies. Great album. Just put it on. Oh, the whole thing. Just the whole thing. I Soup the it. nuts. Just. Get into it. If you don't know Gear Daddies, look them up. We'll, we'll let them know. And Billy's Live Bait. And then there's a little secret shack. I want to drive the Samboni at the, at the end of Billy's Live Bait. That'll set you free. Yeah, well, we're going to get an affiliate link on that and make a, a, a mint That's off right. of it. This yes. is the Hi-Fi Clinic. Yep, yep. Uh, in 10 years, what band should our friends at Numero Group search for mm. to publish mm -hmm. as an archival reissue at that time? Mm. There's a little bit of a trick question, right? Because yeah. that band has to be sort of good enough but then you expect that they're gonna fail kind of like uh yeah. wilco did yeah right <laughs> exactly um who are those guys um there's these guys that i um they're from the north shore they were a bunch of brothers little short guys that looked like the beatles um they were really really good um you see them at a street fest i did but then i actually saw them live a couple times they're really good um and I can't remember the name. This is too many of old styles have killed that brain cell. Yeah. So let's forget that one. Let's come up with another one. Um, um, oh. I see, I see the little um, monkey running yeah, in there. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's kind of turning it's the wheel. Up, yep, yep, the gears are turning. He's got the gold bond on. Um, Do you want to come back to that one? We got to come back to that. We, I'm gonna. It'll be like Tourette's. I'll blurt it out, and then uh, oh, yeah. Okay. That's a great question. Wow, that's a really good one. And it maybe explain Numero Group and archival reissue. Do you want me to explain that while you're thinking for ten seconds? Well, Numero Group is quite honestly one of the greatest institutions ever, and uh, it should be supported and hailed as just amazing. They've saved the. I mean, there was a high watermark of Chicago music. People say. The blues was really, I mean, there really is no Chicago blues. Really, the blues is the Delta. But 
Chicago was the conduit that allowed the blues to sort of be recorded and get out to the masses, right? So there's Chicago blues, I think, is a misnomer. It's a representative of the Mississippi Delta, but if it wasn't for Chicago that allowed these artists to come up and actually perform and have a place to, like, a platform, mm -hmm. amazing. But then from that, you know, it's interesting, a little anecdote, in the early, in the late 80s and early 90s, when you hear um, house music and, like, hip, like, this whole, like, um, they say, oh, that's like UK, like house music and stuff. No, it actually came from Chicago. And like Chicago was like this amazing scene. And before that, you had like West Side blues, you had West Side hip hop, you had South Side. There's actually like the neighbors of Chicago have their own distinct sound. And Numero Group was the, I mean, really is, is, is the one that resurrected that. They found all of these sort of record labels that have gone out of business. They found the original tapes and brought them back. And it's just, I mean, it's amazing that so much talent and so much just amazing music that was unique and revolutionary and influenced really a lot of bands, but then if it would have been lost if it wasn't for a numeral group. So I think it's really important. And add on to that, I mean. No, and I totally agree. I mean, I love it. Um, but you said something to me interesting in the green room before we started recording yes. here. By the way, if you don't realize, the solarium is amazing here. Yeah, I, I mean, good. what you guys have done to the billiard room is great. How do you think I get my tan? But I tell you what, the solarium is fantastic. If, if you guys ever have the means and the opportunity, Come by. This doesn't happen no. under under no. fake bake. No, exactly. Um, but you were telling me something interesting in the green room about your second favorite issue or label mm -hmm. here in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Maybe you'd like to let our eagles in on this secret. Well, yeah, we, and we agree that Numero Group really wouldn't be called a label, correct? How would you say they're That's there? Right. It's a label. Well, it's it an is an archival a, reissue it's an archival label reissue, is what they do. My favorite label itself is Bloodshot, mm -hmm. right? So you've got... And Bloodshot has been really a troubadour or trumpeter or platform for amazing, if you want to call it, all country and punk and country and rock and pop. So Alejandro Escovega, uh, uh, Kelly Hogan, you've got the Mekons, you've got uh, Justin Towns Earl was on there for a little while. Um, really some amazing, Devil in a Woodpile. Um, a lot of these bands that I'm just rattling off have gone and played a lot through the hideout and that's how I got to know these bands at the hideout which is an amazing place to see live shows but the bloodshot records support them go on the website and see their stuff Linda Lovelace is amazing and 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 um and this guy Whitney uh something Whitney I can't remember his name he is like he's like uh this new amazing like just old school country but he's this young guy so just bloodshot record check him out great 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 stuff. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. All right, we're going to be moving on to the lightning round next. And the lightning round is brought to you by Lucas Appliance. Our Eagles know where to shop for the best in household appliances, whether it's 1968 or 2068. Shop Lucas Appliance for all your household needs. So let's move on to this lightning round. And uh, this is, you know, quick questions, quick answers. Not, okay. a, not a lot of blabber. Wait, hold on. Please. Let me, let me yeah. hydrate. Yep, hydrate. All right. Okay, hit me. First question. Who gets the next statue outside Wrigley Field? Gary Pressey or Eddie Vedder? Eddie Vedder. Not that I agree with it, but he will, just from just the popularity. Do you know Gary Pressey? No idea. He's the organist who's been there for 40 years. Again, he deserves it. Eddie Vedder's going to get it. Wow. One of our eagles is going to not like that answer. I'm not I'm just... saying I agree with it. I'm just saying that's going to happen. Wow. Hey, do we agree on who's uh, running this great country now? It's not like we wanted it. It just happened. He made America great again. Uh, <laughs> All right. Who is your dream seventh what inning conductor? What is he sitting in to get that glow? Let's just talk about that. I need to see. Yeah. Uh, who's, who is your dream seventh inning conductor for Take Me Out to the Ball Game? William Patrick Corgan, Liz Fair, or Mike Ditka? Liz Fair, you know why? Wild card. She would go up there and just drop F-bombs, yep. flash the crowd, maybe bottom flash, and just, oh, yeah. just put on a show. Dick has done there, done that. Corgan's been there. Liz Fair needs her time, and she's a dirty bird, not in a good way. She's just very vulgar, and I think she would really just raise some eyebrows. You know she's back on tour now. Uh, she's doing like a of comeback. Or a, of course she yeah, is. Well, I haven't yeah. heard of her in a while, but. Do you have Exit, exit to Guy, Bill? Yes. Great album. Yeah, I like it. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. Okay. She's from Winnetka. Oh, yeah. A little, mm. little privileged. Yeah. But Dirty Bird. Did good. All right. Next question. What song by a Chicago musician would be the theme song of your TV show life? Well, that would be, um, oh, that would be um, the um, Steve Goodman. Uh-oh. And it would be the no, um, a Dying Cubs fan's last request. 
The Dying Cub. So he did a couple songs. He did the Go Cubs Go well, one. Yeah, right? no, but just look up Steve Goodman, a Dying Cubs fan's last request. It'll set you free. All right. Thumbs up or thumbs down on the Let's Play 2 Pearl Jam recording at Wrigley Field. You know what? <laughs> just by the, the sheer joy of it, thumbs up. Have I mean, you seen it, the video? Uh, I have not. But I've, I've listened to the song, and you know what? It's, it's just, it's happy, it's joyful. You can't knock that. You know, it's great. Well, we're going to do an upcoming episode on that, on the Hi-Fi Critics. So I, I give it a Someone's going to knock it. I, well, you know what? And that's okay. But you know what? There's nothing wrong with a little good and joy in the world. Right. Which Chicago bar serves the best old style? Um, I mean, you're drinking one here. This is right. not an official establishment yeah. of... You know, it's funny. Well, there's that great bar uh, on... On Clark Street, about three blocks south of R Wrigley Field, yeah. I think it's Clark and Belmont. Yeah, there's a there's a bar on the east side of the street. It's a little hole in the wall. They have like they sell uh, mezcal and um, not mezcal. What's the uh, malort? They've got malort, and it's just a little hole in the wall. They serve decent old style, and it's just it's just the feel of it. I mean, it's funny. You you get you get outside. Gosh, whew, I need to hydrate. You get outside Wrigley. There's not much old style you see anymore. You can see yeah. a lot of Paps. It's had a resurgent, but yeah. I can't think of the name of the bar, though. I, again, that brain cell is dead. All right. Um, but before you moved to Germany, you know, when you were looking to relax on a lazy Sunday morning, what was your go-to tea blend at Madame Zuzu's? <laughs> uh, God, if I was at Madame Zuzu's, it would be... <laughs> It wouldn't be on a Sunday morning. It'd be well because I was there all Saturday night. AK forty-seven. Yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> and it's, yeah, it's no, fair. never. I, you know what? That's a good. I, I I can't even answer. Never been there, but I know it's Corgan's place. And uh, yeah, never been there. It's closed down now, by the way. Oh, it is. It's gone. Yeah. Okay. And how's his uh, little wrestling thing going too? Is that uh, closed still going down pretty as well? good? No, still going pretty good. Okay. I mean, it, who knows if he'll merge with the WWE at some point? Or, Apparently, or, uh, oh, Pumpkins are going to be doing another. They're looking for a cash grab themselves. No, they're on the cash grab right now. Oh, they are. Oh yeah, we did a segment on this. Oh okay. And uh, the the big question was how many sold out shows will they have in Chicago? By the way, they're going to be here in a couple weeks. Oh, really? How many sold out shows will they have in Chicago? At the time, they had one. Yeah. They had two total shows yeah. scheduled, and I predicted two, even though the second was not. Is it the full band? Uh, Darcy's not there. What happened to her? I think she went Dana Plato. Really? No, she's not. Okay. Okay, that's good. Okay. Now, uh, just got a couple, they, okay, go couple more yeah, lightning, yeah, lightning yeah, sorry, round sorry, questions sorry, here yeah. brought to you by Lucas Appliance, yes. by the way. Once you become a Bitcoin millionaire, what club that no longer exists would you recreate Logics. in your basement? Whoa. Just like read my mind. Longjacks. Longjacks, yeah. Yeah. It's a good one. Yeah. It's been gone for quite a while now, huh? Yeah. It actually, it closed before, it closed like in 90, 98. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you remember Otis's on Halstead? I don't. It, it closed probably just before you moved into now, the city. Now, what was Otis's about? Uh, it was just a, a hole-in-the-wall kind of uh, yeah. live music place right in the middle of all those um, fashion stores now. Okay. But that was, I remember, like, you know, 1995, 96, we went there once or twice on a Thursday night, and then it was gone. Do you remember the guy, we're going to go a little tangent here, sorry, lightning round, but the gentleman that, one of the partners of Boca, Remember, remember our, uh, remember WGPN, JPM, thirty seventy thousand watts. Yep. He was, what was the, what was the oh, place yeah, on yeah. Halstead? That it's, he, it's now Belena. Right, but what was before that guy owned it. It was one of the first Boca, tall guy, blonde hair. We had a conversation with him, and he was talking about a bar that he owned on Halstead in the mid '90s oh, really? that had bands there, and the Pumpkins was one of them. Could be Otis's. And it was nowhere, but he was like kind of rattling, because we were talking about just live venues for music and like elbow room and all these different little, great little places. Um, and he was going, and he said his his place, and it was, it was you know, I had never been there. So that might have been it. And it- We'll have to ask WJPM. Yeah, I was gonna say, but I think, a little, I think a little Googles might bring up a history of that place on that guy, but yeah, yeah. interesting. All right. That's research. Uh, last uh, lightning round question. So with the upcoming Lincoln Yards yes. project threatening the existence of the hideout, it stands. are you willing to chain yourself to the stage in order to keep the bulldozers out? Don't need to do it. It won't be necessary, it's staying. You're going on the record right now. I'm going on the record. That the day you die, 
the hideout will still be there. Yes, because in that area, there's a, a restaurant that's there. Um, in fact, I just read an article that they own that building and they, they are committed to staying there. And they feel that not only, it's interesting, the, um, that husband and wife owners, uh, they are not only committed to bringing um, great music, but also doing um, a well, like philanthropic efforts for the community and what they bring and kind of, they feel that they are like a stabilizing force in that area. And they said that building has been there since before prohibition and they will occupy that building as long, and they own it, and they're gonna stay there, and there's a place for them. Don't you think they would be better off going to, like, Imagine. next door next door to Dirty Nellie's in Naperville? I mean, wouldn't that be a better <laughs> spot for them to be? Dirty Nellie's in, pa in Palatine. Palatine, or, or whatever it's called. Is exactly. Yeah, Naperville, yeah. Palatine, they're yeah. next door to each other, yeah, no. basically. For anybody that's not from Chicago, they're yeah, next no. door to each other. Yeah, no. All right, by the well, way, great shows there, Bob. Great. Well, thanks for being a great sport, William. Thank you. We'd love to have you here on the Hi-Fi Clinic for our expert interview series. The Hi-Fi Clinic is not just a place where dreams turn into memories, but also the most successful lifestyle brand in the vintage audio category. Keep it up. Great work again, Hidalgo. It's been fantastic being here with you. Thank you, William. Yeah. And we'll have we'll we'll see you next time on our expert interview series.